the same as you. Thank you very much, Eric. So, uh, thank you very much for the organizers of uh, the Nordic Growth Forum for having me here. I have a regular at uh, Nordic Approach, but I'm also happy to talk to a broader audience. And, um, and yeah, that's the challenge. And I would like to start with something a bit uh, different. And that's the question of um, how we look at things. So generally, what I've been observing in, in, my, in my past life, what I will talk about is, depending on how we look at things, if we have a one-point experience, we can get really different results. But the result one, we are really happy because we found a difference. So there is something there which is different than the background, which is white. Somebody else at a different time uses a different technique and uh, to look at the same uh, phenomena. And he got a really different result. Well, apparently they were doing something different. And if we compare this experiment, they'll say the result is not significant. The problem when we're working with biological system, as I know, well know, and coffee, it's a highly complex biological system, is that the answer is much more terrifying. <laughs> so if we look at, it, at the whole picture, it's much more complex. It's much more challenging, of course. But this is how, at that point, that we have to look. And I'm not telling you uh, as a researcher, I'm telling you as a, as a normal person that this is the complexity we're looking. And if we don't understand it, we shouldn't feel bad about it because it's really, really complicated. So, having said that, um, who is Coma? Well, we are a science-based uh, based, uh, university spin-off, uh, and we focus on enable consistency quality in coffee by focusing and working on the green bean. Uh, why working on the green bean? Um, well, for me, it was um, that's a point where it's a lot happening, but from from the perception from outside, nobody's really looking at the green bean itself. I mean, coffees are stored in, 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 in a warehouse or at the roastery, and, not, and, and the people think that they are stored there, but it's, it's a seed, it's a living organism, and it's capable to take its own decisions, sometimes to our, uh, to our uh, unpleasant, <laughs> um, uh, or the, the, the result is sometimes unpleasant, but that's, uh, there is a lot happening. Within this, uh, within this coffee bean that we still don't understand. Uh, so we uh, developed some, uh, some technology, also uh, work a lot with, uh, with people from the, from the coffee industry. I'm not an expert in, in sensorics. I have some background in bioanalytical chemistry and biophysical chemistry. And at the end, what we want to do is to uh, find new ways of improving the environment and economic conditions. I'm originally from, from Mexico City. I don't have a family who grows coffee, so I cannot say that that's, that's my drive. But I can't say that I've been observing now how complicated the, the situations are in, in some uh, producing uh, uh, regions in the northern part of Mexico, where people are not, are just, the plants are just growing because they don't want to cut them off. But there is still, uh, the, I, 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 I think there is some potential in those coffees, but there are nobody's buying them except big, big companies that are not not paying much money. And this is where we started working and say, how can we improve it? Yeah, we can improve it from from the farmer side, but I am not in Mexico, so I cannot go back and start working on a farm with what I know. What I can do is go back and and see if we can make a change at the grocery level, at the consumer level, understand what their needs are and how can we provide a solution. As, as, as a future, uh, as, as company. So, well, that can, we can skip. Uh, I would like to start a bit like that you understand why we did this, this, uh, this study and that um, the background I have and the background I bring is just uh, to help, not to, to tell you what to do and what's wrong and what's right. That's not uh, my... Uh, my way of doing things, but let you know how and what uh, what Puma has been working uh, for quite a years. So we work more in an analytical <laughs> perspective. You don't need to understand what Raman spectroscopy is. Nobody understands it. Some people thought it was called Ramon spectroscopy. Ramon is a Spanish name and apparently funny. 
<laughs> so basically it was uh, to use this technique to differentiate between contamination and beeswax. Beeswax is a uh, uh, expensive product and paraffin is really cheap and, and it's uh, produced uh, out, of, uh, out of oil. So uh, using this technique, which I then also use for coffee, and I'm, but I'm not going to talk about it then, then we could really find a way of determining this, uh, this contamination using a lot of, of data analysis, uh, modeling the data, we could be able to even determine really low quantities of paraffin in, 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 in wax. And the, the thing is that you cannot really, as a normal person, you cannot uh, determine the, the difference between the other one. And the advantage of this, this, this analytical technique is that you don't need to destroy, analyze the, the, the material to get an answer. You basically could use it like a, a, a lamp to, to, uh, to monitor this, this part. So now we go a bit more of co in, into coffee. Some guys of you might recognize this, um, this part of the talk, what we'll, all, all we have all, I have already done. Uh, well, we analyzed the uh, water extra, extra of coffee because we thought, okay, we, how can we identify, or what can we find in coffee that's not already published, but it's uh, easy to track. And what most of the compounds is coffee, caffeine, and chlorogenic acids. And uh, we develop a, uh, a methodology where we can really track this blue line's caffeine in determining the concentration. And this apparently has become a, an interesting point for, for roasters that want to have a higher control of their production and see, okay, which coffees have which caffeine level, especially when it comes from decaf. And also now when low caf it's taking a bit of, of the of the decaf uh, business. So this is, uh, I mean, this is a part where actually I didn't do it for fun. Somebody came to me and asked me, is it possible? And it's okay, we found out it's possible. So um, and yeah, and also give us a, an idea for how to use these technologies to monitor the, the green processing that we're doing. Uh, a different aspect, I know it's controversial, but it's, for me it was uh, fun to see that if we can track this small molecule, which is super controversial, Yes, we can. If we use a standard, a standard sample, and a sample, we can find, find the mass of acrylamide. If it's stable, if it's relevant, I'm not going to, to, to go into details. For me, it was just an example of how to find uh, small molecules in, in coffee. There are a lot. I mean, you can see this is one example, and there are a lot of, this is the mass of different molecules, so I think there is there is still a lot of space, but this techno this technique is really expensive. So I don't think that somebody would start demanding people to do this kind of experiments because uh, one experiment costs five hundred euros and a cup of coffee. Well, you know that. So um, and we did a lot of data analysis. Uh, for example, how to use the data what you're collecting. Um, I know there are a lot with, with crops, etc. There are a lot of data that is generated, but there is little people that are really working on understanding. And for me, it's more about how you deal with what's still already there than to generate something, something new. And we start really like, okay, how the data is collected and how we can process it and how we can transform it into data, data analysis. So really, we can see, okay, what's uh, going on in the roasting process and then you can give numbers which numbers that uh, roasters can can work with eventually i know it's complicated to have okay this uh, two exponential uh, equation with a with an with a linear addition that's not, that doesn't tell anybody but if you have some con constants there where people can really work then i think uh, people start be looking at, at this kind of systems to to help them uh, understand what they're, what they're already having a good idea or to put numbers in what they having a lot of, a lot of feeling. So, yeah. And the other thing that are also working is, uh, this is a project with Cafe Imports. So, Sua so will understand that, right? So we did, uh, um, similar for what Morton in, in, uh, in, in, in the coffee mines are doing. We tested different coffees. Some coffees uh, were from for my interest for the uh, co uh, coffee, and then we put like, hey, how are people scoring coffees? And then you can see 
people's core clock is different depending on how they are calibrated and uh, and how how the development uh, of their um, expertise is but in general it was really for me as an as a new person in in the coffee industry was really interesting to see how this part of the sensoric works and it's i must tell you uh, all the chemical analysis they are super expensive uh, anal analysis but our mouth is able to separate between lemon taste and orange taste. But the difference is that the molecule, the difference is it's just my right and my left hand. They look almost identical as the cell, but they are not the same. So you cannot, if you were identical, I could put my right, left hand over my right hand, but I can't. But they look really, really same. And we, we are able to taste the difference. So I think the power of sensorics will never be replaced because it's. We are a really cheap uh, analytical um, <laughs> metal of analysis. Sorry to say. Um, okay, this one. So, uh, and another thing we were also keen about analyzing agronomic data. Um, how does, uh, for example, water, uh, water uh, humidity, sorry, works uh, for us and for the process we're implementing? due to some um, intellectual property reasons, I cannot tell you about which parameter is what. <laughs> but um, we find out that, uh, for example, for uh, humidity, if we increase the parameters, we find a linear correlation in a map of different experiments. Um, but for example, for density, I, have on, I don't have the plot here, but for density was completely different. We didn't find any linear correlation. And everybody loves linear correlations because they're really easy to understand. But unfortunately, nature is not so easy to understand. So having said that, what, where we come and what we've done so far from, from let's say, from the research part, I would like to, to go to move to what's the reason why I'm here, the technology and the implementation part, and hopefully, uh, eventually, to offer you something that, that you can use and you can work with. We're still developing it. There are some things we need to understand. But I think I cannot understand them alone. Um, and this is why I'm, I'm here. So we develop in Coma uh, biophysical process to uh, target two things, preserve flavor and aroma compounds and recover quality characteristics. When I'm saying this fancy word biophysical process, what I mean is we're not using any additional chemicals. The only additional chemical is we're using water in the gas phase. So I think water is not so innocent as we believe, or we want to believe, but uh, at least according to the normative and the, and, and the safety, food safety issues, water is really, really innocent from that concept. So we're happy to be working with something which is uh, not uh, heavily chemical. So uh, we have found a way to interrupt the, to interrupt the biological process of aging, and our works work as you already saw it's really based on on on, on, on a scientific uh, <coughs> ground but we i want to be that really clear we want to work together with the coffee industry it's not that we want to say this is how things are i'm here to learn also not only to show you uh what we have achieved or what ha what we have achieved so this is the whole uh, problem in my eyes. So conventional coffee preservation is most likely focused on the outside. So you know all the all, all the technologies that have been developed so far. We started with special containers. In special container, I'm talking about uh, from uh, large containers down to materials that have been developed to preserve in bags coffees and other aspects which are okay using vacuum. And two is nitrogen, so oxygen-free atmosphere, refrigerating, freezing coffee, whatever you, you, you say or whatever you choose. The only thing that will govern what's inside or what's happening inside the coffee bean, it's the coffee bean itself. Nothing else. It might be slowed by some uh, aspect, but all the measurements that we're doing outside, they're just like uh, preventing what will eventually happen. So why is that taking place? The reason is really simple. From the very beginning, for the coffee industry, the seeds, the coffee seeds and the cells within the seed, 
they're put into stress. Why? Because the seed doesn't want to become a, an excellent cup of coffee or a crappy cup of coffee. It wants to grow and become a plant. So already that situation transforms these cells or this seed or put these cells in this seed uh, into cellular stress. What does that mean? Well, it means that it develops some mechanisms to preserve life as long as it's possible until, until it pounds away to become a plant. If that seed sees, sorry for the repetition, no future <coughs> in becoming a plant, it will eventually start, start uh, uh, a shutdown process where the, the cell kills itself and ends with cellular death. But um, this cellular stress is also enhanced during to some external factors. So loss of moisture, temperature fluctuation, etc. etc. So far, if you look a bit back what has been discussed in the in the coffee industry, we just have a digital part, like coffee of, uh, of when the cells are dead, coffee tastes crappy, and when the coffee is alive, the beans are alive, coffee tastes good. Actually, the more point is what happens in between, and even afterwards, because even if the cells are dead, there's still some activity there, some remaining activity, some um, post-mortem activity that still does whatever it wants. So um, for me, it was also really interesting that part to discover that actually the, the process is more complex. So this is why I showed you the first picture in the very beginning. So to move you a bit from that digital perception that we have. It's nice, I know, now it's a bit annoying that you say, okay, everything I thought I know, it might change. And maybe I don't have the right answer, but my idea or my, my the point here is uh, to let you think about that part which brings actually the, the, the most, uh, the key changes in flavor. So, how do we do it? Well, we develop a set of uh, experiments or, 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 or measurements where we evaluate the coffee from the very beginning, chemical analysis, coffee sensorics, and actually it should be the other way around. So we, do first the, the cupping and the, and, the, and the sensoric part, and then we choose which chemical method we implement, because otherwise it would be a bit expensive. We also are also interested where the coffee comes from, how long has it been stored, where has it been stored. It's difficult to get this data because sometimes people really don't, are not sure about it or don't, do not want to talk about it. And it's completely understandable, don't take me wrong about it. Then we implement uh, the process, which is, um, an instant necrobiosis. What I mean is, we put the coffee beans into the chamber, we apply the process, which is basically kills the cells within less than one second. So we remove the choice of the coffee bean to decide what to do with the with the with the flavor with the flavor molecules. So at that point, the flavor molecules just are uh, the shelf life of this flavor molecule is determined by the chemical shelf life not what the cell decides to do with, with, the, with these molecules themselves. And then um, afterwards, after the process, we perform again and evaluate how the process uh, uh, has developed. Um, and here to bring you an example. So I don't know if you can see it, but we will try to test the, the extraction in water. So basically just put the coffee beans in, in water and see how they develop. We know from the reference that, for example, chlorogenic acid oxidizes in water. Why is it so? Because the increase in pH uh, ends up in, um, and it also the, the increase uh, in, uh, in oxy uh, oxygen levels in, in water uh, leads uh, to, um, or put it the other way around, chlorogenic acid controls the level of oxygen in cells. So if we put them in water, then the, 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 the beans notice that there is higher levels of oxygen, then the chlorogenic acid uh, goes to, to, the, to the oxygen molecules dissolved in water, react with them, sacrifice themselves, and there, there they control to a certain extent uh, oxygen levels. In our case, this is not happening. Why is it not happening? Because 
the, the compound that, the, like the enzyme that controls this process, the polyphenol oxidase, it's completely fully deactivated. So what we preserve is also like levels of chlorogenic acid. And I'm not saying, okay, chlorogenic acid is the, the target of, of our experiment. It's just an example of how we can control what's in the coffee bean. So just don't take it like, okay, I said chlorogenic acid is relevant, so it's just an example. So we have it here after 24 hours and here after 150 days. And you still see, okay, the, chlor the, the beans look not nice. They're starting to be, get a bit uh, big and, uh, and absorbing water, uh, but the oxidation process no, never took place as it took in the, in the coffee beans. In the, sorry, in the reference coffee beans. Here we have the processed coffee beans, and there we have the, the, the reference beans. So I hope that's clear and interrupt me anytime uh, you, you want. So let's go to a bit of the results. So uh, I didn't have a clue about roasting, so I got uh, to the guys of Roast and asked them to help them, and they were really keen in helping us. And we developed a spe specific, or we started studying the, the roasting profile of the process coffees, because after the process, the coffee beans changed, of course. And since I have neither experience in roasting on my coffee, nor our coffee, so I said, okay, well, that's a great start. So, um, Trond and Sverre helped us out to understand this part and, and developing, or at least understanding and observing how the, the, the roasting pro how can we improve the roasting profile to get out, um, to reach the same level of, of roasting. And here we have three examples where we have three different profiles. And in black is the reference, or so the unprocessed coffee. Blue is our processed coffee. And the reason why I'm showing you is, let's see, the coffee's still they behave somehow similar but they are changing so this is uh, for me it's something relevant to understand that we're dealing with a slightly different coffee but it doesn't mean that that's uh, bad or better so it's uh, it requires the energy or the, the temperature changes or yeah the energy that the coffee is absorbing it's different so we have to rethink a bit the way uh, of roasting at least for the coffees that are processed and uh, again, I'm showing this one for the sake of, uh, of comparison. What we did, we were just looking at the ratio between um, caffeine levels and chlorogenic acid. And the, the point was, is there any change? Is there any change of the process and to these uh, compounds that are in huge amounts? So we know uh, that there is no change. So because the ratio of like the intensity of these two peaks is similar, so we can assume that the, the, our process is not affecting in a large extent the, the, the compounds that are in, in, in let's say, in, in, in huge quantities. So we're still, not, we're still developing the process, we're improving the process for the smaller, more sensitive compounds, but at least we're sure that we're not generating uh, huge negative changes in the coffee. And this experiment we did with Nordic approach last year. Uh, I was, to be honest, I didn't have time to plot the, uh, the different uh, process. And this was our first experiment, our first take into this, uh, our first dive into the processing. And now the gap is closing. So in blue is the, our uh, processed coffee, and in black is the unprocessed coffee. And uh, at the very beginning, we observe a uh, as, uh, some changes, but um, but after a year, I'm still learning that uh, we have to. This, every coffee has a different uh, uh, character. So, uh, and, uh, as you already know, what I'm telling you, but um, the process also depends on when we apply it and how we apply it. At this point, this proof that the our idea makes sense, but we're still working and improving it for really reaching the point that quality has uh, is to be maintained for a longer period. In the case of the Ethiopian heirloom, which was collaboration with Bonanza, the coffee was already aged. So if there we could show that if we process the coffee, we can recover some notes, uh, some positive uh, notes in the coffee. Whereas the Tanzania was uh, a bit difficult because uh, it wasn't aged. The process was a bit maybe too aggressive and the difference the changes in the difference were not as we expected. 
But again, this is a learning process. This is almost a year experiment, and that that takes time. So to make changes after uh, and, and understand what happened in a year, I think it's uh, and and change decisions that you did a year. Well, if uh, to be honest, I would do some some things maybe a different way, change the process, less aggressive. I don't know, but I'm I'm still learning in, in this process. So, but this is just to give you an idea what what can we achieve, and if we do the process right, I think we can uh, continue this uh, this pan uh, a little more and preserve coffee for a longer period and also recover quality. Um, that's from my side first. Thank you very much for listening. I have some people to thank. So for the coffee sample, Nordic Approach, Cafe Imports, Nico, and the guys of Carabella. And from the roasting, uh, uh, Röst and Puro Manifesto, and all my former university, and the guys from PWD Tech for lending me some equipment. And now comes the part. So first of all, this is not this is by far no cup of excellence, by far <laughs> no the championship. So if you're not uh, comforting and, and testing this coffee, I won't be offended at all. I just ask you to try it. So we have uh, five different pairs of coffees. We have a Kenya process, uh, Kenya coffee, which was frozen. When I refer to process, I refer to the process of Kama, so that you don't get confused with uh, any post harvest processing. Um, and this coffee was uh, from 200, uh, 2018, and it was processed in August uh, uh, two, uh, 2018. We have again a Colombia coffee, which was really aged. So this is why we generally call the, 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 the process, or we define the process as flavor boost, because we increase or recover some uh, positive aspects of the coffee. We have our working horse, horse, it's a Costa Rica coffee that we buy from uh, somebody that sells green coffee and this has been really fun to, to do a lot of testing, independent testing. And this coffee, I would be, if you don't want to try that, skip A9 because this is a moldy coffee and this is an experimental thing that we're doing. Um, some, a year ago I found that this, if we, if we, we develop a process to get the mold, moldy taste of, of coffee. But this is still an ongoing process and it's difficult to implement because fortunately there is not so many moldy coffees as uh, in consumer <laughs> countries but there are still some in producing countries and this happened actually when i got received this coffee it was contaminated uh, according to the people the person who gave it to me uh, because it was mixed with roasted coffee but actually the real contamination was it was tasty mold so um the experiment, uh, I'm just really curious about to see how the experiment worked because I think it did work as I would like to, but it's hopefully going in the right direction. And the last coffee, it's also an aged coffee and we improved the quality uh, to some extent. And again, so please uh, think about that it's not an excellent a cup of excellent coffee. There is, after that, I guess there's water and some other coffee. And yeah, thanks for listening. Thank you. Question? I mean, I also just. I guess, uh, yeah, so the question is about the, the possibilities at origin, and maybe that's a side that we don't see some of the time because we go there, we buy our 10 bags of a top lot, and then we don't see the three containers the producer didn't sell that year and they have to sell maybe um, during the next year so well that point um so this is the reason why i demonstrated the moldy coffee that would be maybe not let's not put, put it as a moldy coffee let's put it the coffee with higher water activity this process is able to stabilize that part of water activity and guarantee that at least that quality will be maintained and and there won't be the uh, no no um worse development so if you take the other things into account, so I'm not, I'm, I'm being honest and not and transparent. So uh, if we can control all, all that, then I think we can uh, improve uh, uh, or at least not improve the production because this is not the goal of my team. But, but from what we have, we can get the most or try to get the most out of it. So 
All right. Nice. I have a question. So just to repeat the question for the for the video. So if we start with the question to compare it with like decaffeination or steaming that's already used in industry, mm -hmm. in what way is this different? Um, first of all, when we started also the project, we saw a lot of similarities because green coffee processing, there's just two, two, these two options that you mentioned. So we have to uh, have been looking really closely to this, uh, to the industry of, uh, of decaf and, and, and steaming because that's where we are. So not, I'm not lying about it. Um, the difference is um, steaming is reducing the bad quality. Our goal is um, making m available what's in the coffee. It's not removing the bad stuff, but uh, a coffee that's uh, okay. Okay, the woodiness, yes, I agree. That part we improve. But how the process works in a simple way is, for example, for an aged coffee. What happens is that uh, in the end, in the roast process, the sugars and the amino acids are not able to react, not because they're not in the coffee. There are studies about that the sugar levels do not decrease with time, but the availability or how a fancy word to call it, the bioavailability of, this, of these compounds is not there. So when the roasting process starts, these compounds are not, let's say, physically or at the same, at the same place, they cannot be brought together. And our process allows that part of the, of, of, of the, uh, of the processing in coffee, like the roasting to, to run and let this, uh, this compounds that they are there to react and form like the, the, the nice, uh, the, uh, nice caramelization process. And the other hand is, uh, we, I'm still not sure where the precursor of woodiness develops, if it's in the roast, if it's still in the green coffee. But either this process uh, interrupts the, um, the precursor, the formation of the precursor, which would be, um, I don't know, some uh, oxidated lipids, or it, uh, it degradates it to a certain extent that during the roasting process, um, it it gets diluted in the and it's uh, it doesn't become a, a a a predominant note in flavor. So I I see our process more like to improving than to removing. Okay, I hope that answered your question because now it's time for fika. That means uh, coffee break in Swedish.